Hello to our viewers in Singapore and around the world. Welcome to another episode of Words and Music. I'm your host, Loretta Alabons. My guest today is British pop band Star Sailor's vocalist and guitarist James Walsh. Star Sailor burst into the music scene in 2001 with the success of their debut album, Love Is Here. And the album also earned them the title of Britain's best new band. Over the years, Star Sailor has achieved so many hits and topped the UK charts and enjoyed their fair share of prestigious tours, opening for the likes of the Rolling Stones, the Killers, the Police and U2. In 2021, Star Sailor will be celebrating their 20th anniversary of their first album. So join me as I speak with James Walsh on their anniversary plans, being the last band who worked with legendary music producer Phil Spector and more interesting stories. So let's watch. Hi, James. Welcome to Words and Music. Hi, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Welcome. And just to provide some context, could you let us know where you're talking to us from? Um, I'm in Altdorf in Switzerland, um, having a few days break. How are you surviving all this craziness with COVID-19? Just trying to look to the future, really, and, and um, carrying on being active on social media and streaming and um, making music as well. I'm, I'm in a, I'm luckily in a position that I can, I have a little recording set up so I can make and release solo music. Um, and yeah, just hoping that, that it'll all be over soon and we can get back to get the music industry back as we as we knew it yeah it's just so i would call it tragic you know yeah we, we were all yeah. just wondering what are we gonna do you know this has been you know just like yourself you know you're almost you know 20 years in the business we started our company our first show in 2002 and all of a sudden we have to stop everything yeah, no, it's it's crazy. You know, I want to um, talk about, um, you know, the stories behind meeting Phil Spector. We met Phil Spector through his daughter, Nicole, um, who was good, good friends with our US radio plugger at the time. And uh, also a, a very keen enthusiast for British music. And she... Uh, she persuaded her her dad that we would be a, a great band to work with and um incredibly he, he agreed and, and got on, on board and we recorded some music with him. That time that was into your second album, right? Yeah, yeah. How did a new band from England come to have, you know, this amazing stroke, right? It was a big stroke of luck to to stumble upon you know, this amazing producer. It was surreal, really. Yeah. We didn't think it was a possibility because he hadn't worked for such a long time, although we were massive admirers of, of his previous work with John Lennon and the Ronettes and Dion and all these people. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a tragedy that uh, things took a a very dark and uh, twisted turn and that that whole episode is kind of uh what's the word it's not something we can, re we can really look back on with any fondness it was definitely exciting at the time mm -hmm. um but i think it's difficult it's difficult to speak fondly or to celebrate someone who's uh, who's in incarcerated for some pretty bad things so that's uh, yeah, but we're, the main the main thing about it is that we're we're proud of the songs. We, yes. Um, we wrote the songs together as a band, and they still resonate. And uh, um, yeah, it's just it's just uh, we're proud of the record that we that we made. Also, after Phil finished, we carried on with uh, Danton Supple finished mm -hmm. the record with mm -hmm. him mm -hmm. um, and he did a great job as well. Excellent. You know, I just got to ask you this question. <laughs> I know, it's <laughs> not, but you cannot, you, you can choose not to answer. 
were there any guns laying around at that time when you went to the house of Phil Spector? <laughs> Did you see uh, no, any guns? No. Okay. No. Okay. We we just uh, we just ate some sandwiches and um, we were quite disappointed to be honest because we thought uh, not not that there weren't any guns but we thought that uh, someone of his stature um, would lay on this massive feast. And, oh, uh, okay. It was just like takeaway sandwiches. So. Yeah. They were nice sandwiches. I'm not. I'm not complaining too much. But uh, yeah, that was a, a funny episode. And are you still in touch with the daughter? Uh, no, unfortunately not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure if she's what she's doing now. I think she's moved into journalism more than uh, kind of being in the music world. So Star Sailor will forever kind of, you know, be referred and remembered as the last band to work with Phil Spector? Because you were the last band that he worked with, right? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, quite a strange feeling. <laughs> Not looking about what he has done, but just, you know, someone who's a big, for people who are big music fans and appreciate all the great work he's done, you know, it's, you know, it is what it is and it's a cool, yeah. a cool yeah. label to have, you know. Like I say, it's kind of strange with everything that ha that's happened since, like how that kind of affects his legacy and our place in it is uh, difficult to comprehend, really. Because, like you say, the the work is still there and it's still great. So next year's twenty years to you know your first album. It is, yeah, yeah. How are you preparing for it? What is the band gonna do? To celebrate 20 years well we had obviously like had all these plans and gigs booked in the new year and um, that we've had to postpone um but the main we're speaking to a brewery about uh, doing a beer a new beer to celebrate the band's 20 year anniversary um, and we want to re-record some of the tracks um and try and find a different angle for them. Um, I really like the music of uh, Hosier, mm. that kind of bluesy, gospel, soulful sound. And I think that particularly our song Fever would really benefit from that that kind of vibe. So we want to rework that and a few of the other tracks to do a new release um, Maybe not the whole album. A lot, a lot of people do that, but maybe just a selection of songs from the album in a in a different uh, a different vibe, mm -hmm. uh, rather than just straightforward re-release everything, and then go out and and do some shows, mm -hmm. uh, play. It's it's the obvious thing to do, but I think people would like us to kind of play the. The album from start to finish and uh, it will give the people what they want <laughs> definitely for sure yeah. i mean it's it's really a big um moment you know when you can celebrate yeah. being in a band you know for 20 years i think it's important as well that we like with the re the re-recordings we want to sit down and work out how we can put on a really great show maybe introduce some uh, guest musicians and vocalists and just do something a bit different than just the four of us kind of plowing through the songs as usual we want to because the 20th anniversary is only going to come around once so we want to make sure it's it's a special occasion for wherever you come to watch the show as well if it's in Leeds or Manchester or London it's still a the same kind of quality. Are you going to maybe, you know, like after every song, um, do some kind of a narration? Yeah, I think it would be a good opportunity to go into more depth about how the songs came about. Um, but I guess it depends on the attention <laughs> level of the crowd. I think sometimes that might work better as like a seated, almost theatrical show. Whereas I feel like standing audiences want to dance and 
have a drink and just listen to the song. So that could be an idea for something uh, something a bit more subdued and uh, uh, relaxed, yeah. How did the name uh, Star Sailor come about? Could you just um, let your fans, new fans in Asia, know? There's a Tim Buckley album called Star Sailor, and uh, we nicked the name from that. Um, like the band Low is named after the David Bowie album Low, so uh, we thought it was. Uh, we were we had our first gig in London, and we didn't have the name on the poster yet. Um, and the venue were in a hurry, obviously, to put a name on the poster because the we changed our we were changing our name at the time, and I just had a Tim Buckley album around the house and thought that's a, that's a good name for a band, and the rest is history. Wow! And I also read that you you enjoyed listening to the late Jeff Buckley. Oh yeah, yeah. I think vocally. Him and Van Morrison are a huge influence and really what I aspire to as a singer, I want to um, be as, as, try and be as good as they are, really. Being such a fan of um, Jeff Buckley, were you um, kind of surprised that he, he passed on um, you know, suddenly? I was quite young when it, it happened and I was... Uh, I only really came to know his music kind of after his his death, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but reading into reading into it and uh, hearing about it, it was definitely a a tragedy, a, an unfortunate thing mm-hmm. to to happen. Um, yeah, just I think he he definitely had some something more to offer the world and. The world of music is mm-hmm. a, an unbelievable, unbelievable talent. So. so, you know, this whole thing, you know, when we kind of started this Words and Music was for us as promoters to fall in love with music again. Because previously, yeah. for us as, you know, promoters here in Asia, it's a very transactional thing. You know, we're just booking the bands and you don't have much time as a promoter to, you know, um, kind of listen to all the great you know, work that's coming out from all these bands and you don't have the time to listen to the music, yeah. you know? So yeah. when we started this Word to Music, we said, let's get back to why we, as an independent promoter, you know, um, wanted to get into the business. It was not yeah. because of the I... financial, it was never the financial rewards for us, you know, it was the love yeah. of the music, and uh, yeah. and so we just said, you know, we have the time now. And we said, it's better now than never. We're so happy that, you know, your management said, let's do something with Star Sailor. The 20th anniversary is coming around. And so this opportunity cool. is, is really wonderful. And I got a chance to, you know, listen to all your songs, all the albums. You know, I've, I'm familiar with, you know, Four to the Floor, some of the, the great work that you've done. But, you know, listening to all your great albums. You know, since we can't have the tours, James. Yeah. Do you recall, or can you just tell us some of the most memorable tours that uh, you've played at? Touring America is always an amazing experience. We did a tour recently. I say recently, a few years ago, um, which is fairly recent in the long history. Um, with Embrace, who are another big uh, UK band. And we were all uh, touring on the same bus, so that was a, a nice experience um, to kind of hang out with them and um, see the sights. Uh, remember, uh, there were some long bus journeys um, and some amazing gigs people we'd not played in america for such a long time so the people were really excited to see us um one of my favorite places to visit in recent memory is uh mexico we played in mexico city um and it's probably the most passionate crowd and people that i've ever 
played for. We were, we were young and the crowds were young and there was this like intense energy in the air, um, which obviously when you get older, you kind of, the, pe- the fans we have now are lovely, but obviously we're all a bit older, so we can't be quite as energetic and passionate. And But when we went back to Mexico, it was like that energy again. It was like that passion and loudness and just, it was incredible. It was really a, a great experience. And South Korea as well. Um, we've played in Seoul a few times. I just really appreciate as well that both those places, we played there recently, so the, the fans are obviously very loyal, whereas some places you kind of get big crowds on your big albums and it's nice, and but then when things aren't as big or, or you're not the kind of hot new band, those places kind of stop buying tickets mm-hmm. whereas like I say Seoul and South Korea and um, we played the Pentaport festival as well um, just really loyal and passionate and amazing fans the UK has been pretty good as well to us as well so yeah I've also noticed that you actually toured with many of these um, legend bands like the Rolling Stones the Police can you share with um, the, the fans in Asia about those experiences and how did it come about? Yeah, we, we played with the Rolling Stones a few times. Um, there was one occasion where Amy Winehouse, unfortunately, had to uh, pull out of a support that she was doing for them in Germany. Uh, so we got a last-minute call. It was like, can you get on a flight tomorrow <laughs> to play with the Rolling Stones and wow. that was uh, that was very exciting. We'd played with them previously but we'd had a chance to build up to it and and uh, get excited about it and this was this was incredible because it was one minute you kind of go into Tesco's to do your shopping the next day and the next minute it's like no you, you're playing with the Stones. Um, but I think that the most humble um like mega star artists that we've played with. When we played with R.E.M. in Dublin, Michael Stipe actually came to the dressing room to to thank us for being there and for playing and was just a very lovely, humble person where I'm sure they all are, uh, but I found that extremely endearing and, and just mm-hmm. amazing that someone someone with, with his success and fame was uh, still appreciative of the support acts and um, we just got a picture with the Rolling Stones and uh, we didn't see Bono when we played with you two so wow. REM's my favourite. <laughs> wow and what year was that James yeah. with REM? I can't remember to be honest I think it was two. We were working on our fourth album. So it must have been 2008, 2009 sort of time. Mick Jagger was at the time like a, a fan. So he loved Star Sailor's songs. Yeah, I think, uh, I do seem to remember him saying that uh, he bought the first album. So, uh, yeah, we obviously appreciate that. And apart from Michael Stipe, any other uh, stories? tours on the road the band that we've enjoyed touring with the most and and probably have played the most gigs with is the charlatans another great uk band from the sort of manchester northwich region um and tim burgess is a, a really great guy and has really come into his own throughout the uh coronavirus epidemic because he's been hosting these album listening parties and uh, we did one for love is here and yeah they're they're a really a really good uh, bunch of people i'm familiar with the charlatans and I, I mean this is we'll definitely you know go back and listen to some of their music too you know i wanted to get your take too among this amidst this pandemic i think the shocking news to us was 
you know, Q magazine going out of business? Well, sadly, not unpredictable because people just aren't really engaged with music. Well, obviously you are, and there, there's still a, a small and passionate kind of community. But I think the general public just aren't as engaged with music, whether it's because the places they would normally go are all closing or because they, they don't have the enthusiasm anymore. It's just, it seems to be that people listen to tracks on Spotify or wherever and don't really think about who's doing them and what their stories are. And that was a big, that was a big part for me growing up. I, I was obsessed with music and I was obsessed with the people making it and I enjoyed reading Q and the NME to know what Oasis were doing and um, Blur and Pulp and all those bands and was fascinated by what they thought about the world. And it's just, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like people are that, or at least they're, they're obviously not um, interested enough to keep, to keep the magazines that, run those stories going, which is a real shame, I think. Hopefully there'll be other new outlets, you know, for entertainment, for music to come through. What do you think about the streaming platforms? I think they're, they're great for the consumer because they get so much music for so little money. <laughs> um, but not great for the artists, really. I think... Um, it's kind of devalues the artist. It's like saying this is what you're worth and it's not very much really. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. something needs to be done to to address the to redress the balance because it's it seems very heavily if the relationship is with the artist, the streaming platform and the consumer, then the consumer and the streaming platform are are getting a much better deal than the people making the music. That's a good point. So why are the tickets so cheap? Because it's the first thing we've done and because it's not a live gig, I think it's quite a fair price. And and also it's not really the it's not the the music lovers' fault that Spotify don't pay us enough. I think uh it, see, it seems also a lot of our fans are kind of a working class and maybe don't have the money to, to pay uh, 10, 20 pounds to sit in front of a, a laptop. So mm. I think it's, uh, we want to make sure as many people can access that experience as, as possible. Um, unfortunately as well, uh, there's so much free content available with YouTube and Instagram and Twitter and they're great platforms to promote your music and get it to a, an audience. Um, but that creates an expectation that all uh, streamed gigs and live things uh, should be free or, or should cost very little. So I think it's it felt like a kind of fair price to... Uh, to do. At one point, we're saying to ourselves, when is the streaming going to, you know, like the live streaming, everybody was just, you know, streaming something for the sake of doing it, you know, in the big, in the, yeah. during the May, June time frame. But now, luckily, it's, you know, I mean, you know, artists are able to monetize. Yeah, I think, uh, I think a lot of artists are just desperate to kind of keep if all, apart from to kind of keep the fans engaged, to keep themselves uh, healthy and happy and creating art and putting it out there, I think to if there's any way to to carry on doing that, then a an artist is gonna is gonna uh, keep going and and keep trying. How are you and the rest of the band handling this? Um COVID situation, like mentally, physically. So how are you coping? What are you doing? Just staying creative. I think I'm lucky that I'm, I'm a creative person. So I, I've still, 
obviously get a huge amount of enjoyment from playing live and um, I'm missing that but I also get a huge amount of enjoyment from writing and recording and there's nothing to stop me doing that uh, so I'm able to to concentrate my energies on on doing that and doing the odd kind of uh, Instagram gig or whatever just to just to stay connected and and to, yeah I think it's uh, I feel sorry for those touring musicians who maybe who aren't create who are incredible musicians but maybe aren't creative and their passion and their energy is from playing live and doing studio sessions that they're not able to do now I think it's a really a difficult time for them and the crews of course the the people that work behind the scenes on gigs that uh, are really suffering I think it's it's important that uh, the governments around the world kind of get their heads together and do more to support the music industry the, the local music industry mm-hmm. And also the promoters too. I think the promoters also, there's a big, you know, the venues, yeah. the promoters, <laughs> yeah. everything, the yeah, merch, yeah, the, the concession the stands. It's such a, you know, such a big, I mean, we didn't we didn't realize, you know, we kind of took everything for granted also, James, you know. I mean, we just didn't realize, you know, how precious everything, you know, is until, you know, we just hope for the best. Yeah. I just want to go back to 2001 um, if you could go back in time to that whole process, 2000 to 2001, and recording Love is Here, what would you have done differently? Or would you have done anything differently at all? I don't think I'd have done anything differently. I think... Uh, Everything was organic? Everything just yeah. fell into place, like how it was supposed to be? Yeah, obviously you... you we're more experienced now, and I think the songs have evolved. And um, but you can't, you can't sort of fast forward in a time machine and gain that experience and then go back. It's it was the best album we could have possibly made with the tools and the experience and the the producer and everything we had at our disposal. We we put everything into it, and we. Obviously, that it it worked. So, I'd maybe be talking differently if it had flopped and and hadn't been the this uh, big thing for us. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I'm really proud of what it's helped us to achieve since. It's it's a big, it's the foundations of of what we what we've become and what we hopefully can carry on doing. What words would you want to say to your fans in Asia? To the fans in Asia, I think, uh, yeah, just um, keep safe. Uh, keep in enjoying music, because even though gigs can't happen, um, bands are still, are still there on their social media, the music's still there to listen to. So keep supporting music while you can't go to gigs. And hopefully... Um, the pandemic will be over one day and we can all uh, get together again and, and have a great time playing and watching music. And thank, thanks, obviously, also for all your support over the years. We've played in Singapore and Japan and uh, South Korea, is, like I say, is particularly special for us. Hong Kong, thanks for uh, supporting us over the years. Thank you, James. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed our conversation there. Talking to James Walsh just makes you really appreciate the live going to concerts. Thank you, James. And we look forward to your anniversary, Star Sailor's anniversary and new music in 2021. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also check out Words and Music on our podcast channel on Omni. Spotify, Google, and Apple. So that's it for the show this week. Until next week, my name is Loretta Alabons for Words and Music. 